if you're a business owner, there's going to come a point where you need a stronger tech stack to have a clear picture of everything all in one place. From startup to enterprise, NetSuite is your one-stop solution. Visit netsuite.com slash SPI to download their KPI checklist for free and support this podcast too. If you do find yourself buried in manual work or struggling to have a clear picture of your business, you should know three numbers. 37,000, 25, and one. 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have been upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. 25, NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. And the number one, because your business is one of a kind. So you can get a customized solution for all of your KPIs and one efficient system when, with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash SPI. That's netsuite.com slash SPI to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash SPI. There was once a time when building a website was a massive undertaking and a huge pain, something that you would need to clear your entire schedule for. Well, guess what? Those days are over, and now you can build a professional, sparkling website in just seconds, thanks to Hostinger. In fact, I recently did this, and I shared the process on my YouTube channel, and it was absolutely mind-blowing, especially considering it took like days on end previously when I first started building websites. This tool is amazing, and I was using AI to do it. So Hostinger is a top highly rated global web hosting and website creation brand, right? And all you have to do to build a website is answer three questions. Here it is. You enter your brand name, you select the website type, you describe your business, and then you can customize it further with a drag and drop editor. It's literally that simple. I just went through this process. I promise you, it is the easiest way to build a website. And it also offers some AI-driven SEO-friendly copy, an AI logo maker. Plus, they make all this super affordable. It's less than $3 a month, including a free domain name. So create a live website now at hostinger.com slash SPI. And listeners of this podcast can enter SPI for 10% off your order and a free domain name. H-O-S-T-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash SPI and use the code SPI for 10% off and a free domain name. It's incredible. Now back to the show. This is a Smart Passive Income podcast with Pat Flynn, session number 69. You got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. Welcome to the Smart Passive Income Podcast, where it's all about working hard now so you can sit back and reap the benefits later. And now your host, who learned how to fold laundry by watching YouTube, Pat Flynn. Job searches can feel like they're taking forever, a real slog. So stop searching and just match with Indeed. So ditch the busy work, use Indeed for scheduling, screening, messaging, so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. If you wanna hire fast, you need to go where the talent is. You can get unparalleled access to job seekers with over 350 million unique visitors globally, according to Indeed data, and an extended reach through Glassdoor. I love how adaptable Indeed is uh, as well, whether you're hiring one person or you need lots for a scalable project, like hiring platform that lets you schedule and interview hundreds of candidates in one day, like there's no other one that you would wanna use. So join more than three and a half million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at indeed.com slash smart passive. Just go to indeed.com slash smart passive right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash smart passive. Terms and conditions apply. You need to hire, you need Indeed. If you're at a desk a lot like I am, it is really important to move around and increase circulation as much as possible. And a sit slash stand desk can be a massive game changer. If you haven't tried one before, this offer from Uplift is for you. Plus you can support the show at the same time. Visit upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. Uplift Desk is the place to go. There are so many customization options, plus free 30 day returns, free shipping, free accessories with every desk. And did I mention the industry-leading 15-year warranty? It's no wonder they've been wire cutters pick for six years in a row. Plus, they offer a great range of ergonomic chairs and storage systems if you want to give your whole workspace a makeover. They even have an augmented reality feature so you can see what your new desk will look like in your space using your phone. I mean, they even make a height-adjustable conference table that doubles as a regulation-sized ping-pong table. These folks have really thought of it all. 
And if you want to build the workstation of your dreams, I highly recommend checking them out. Just go to upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. That's U-P-L-I-F-T desk.com slash SPI to get 5% off your entire order. Hey, hey, what's up? This is Pat Flynn and welcome to session 69 of the SPI podcast. So happy, so happy as always to be bringing you another show today. Just a really quick thank you to those of you who messaged me on Twitter after the last session, session number 68. I had a blast just just reading all of those tweets about it. It was just hilarious. Um, you know, some people laughed. Some people even got a little bit upset at me, not in like a, you know, really aggressive way, but just, you know, ha ha ha, that was funny uh, type of way. Um, and if you're not exactly sure what I'm talking about, well, then I guess you got to listen to episode 68. And this brings me right into exactly what we're going to talk about in today's episode, and that is building buzz. You know, How do you build buzz for something that you're coming out with soon or something that maybe uh, you have already that you really want people to pay attention to? You know, When you build buzz for something, you're creating anticipation. You're getting people excited about that, uh, something that's to come, and that's when you get people to want more. That's when you get them to, to do things like keep refreshing your page just to see if what you said was coming out yet or has come out yet, which is something that actually happened to me on my site the other day. And I'll tell you about that in just a second. But if you build buzz and you execute correctly, the results can be amazing. When you build buzz for something, you're doing the work beforehand so that when you come out with whatever it is that you're coming out with, you do the launch or publish or whatever, things start to happen and roll on their own because you've done the hard work already. And of course, as you're launching and publishing, you can do things to keep that buzz going and keep it spreading. Uh, you know, get people who didn't know about whatever it is that you have to uh, realize what they've been missing out on. And these are the things we're going to talk about today. Now, the first thing you have to realize about buzz is that it, it's, it's started by you. It's created by you, but it really is fueled and generated by other people. You know, other people fuel it. People are the engine behind buzz, other people. Buzz is a term used sort of in word of mouth marketing, which today doesn't mean just from person to person in person, but also, you know, person to person or person to persons, plural, on platforms like blogs and social media, um, news, email lists, and all the things we should be paying attention to already if you're doing business online. So the good news is that we have all the tools available to create buzz already. But as we all know, tools need to be used correctly in order for them to work for us. Now, another important distinction to consider before we move on is the difference between buzz and hype. On the surface, they might be considered the same thing, you know, creating buzz for something, creating hype for something, getting people excited. But the main difference between buzz and hype is what people are getting excited for, or actually how and why people are getting excited. To me, hype, the noun, uh, well, actually, let's look at the dictionary definition of it really quick. So hype, noun, two definitions. First one, extravagant or intensive publicity or promotion. You see, this is, to me, what gets people into trouble. It's why uh, internet marketers have a bad name. It's the hype. You know, hype isn't, hype isn't bad necessarily, but overhyping is. And it's really easy to do. That, that's when you hear the, oh, you can earn $5 billion in two days with no work with this one product. I mean, it's, it's just ridiculous. And so hype is, is a sort of self-promotion. You know, you're doing it. Primarily, it's sort of an outbound excitement type of thing that, that you're doing. Buzz, however, I mean, th- think about it. Can you over buzz? I mean, have you ever heard of that term, over buzz? There was too much buzz out there. I mean, we don't hear that really very often. And it's because buzz is an inbound form of excitement you know you flip a switch you make the announcement you put things into place and everyone does the talking for you you know and draws attention in toward you that's buzz and when someone else talks about you in an extravagant way it's less dangerous than if you were to talk about yourself in in an extravagant way so i hope that makes sense uh we're not hyping things up we're laying the foundation for buzz to occur okay so what was that second definition it was number two a hypodermic needle or injection or a drug addict, which is kind of interesting uh, when you really think about it. Now, check this out. I'm looking at the origin of the word hype right now, and it comes uh, from 1925 to 1930, Americanism, incense to trick and to swindle. To trick and to swindle. We don't want to trick. We don't want to swindle people. Now, check out the origin of the word buzz. 
Uh, there's a few sort of origins of, of this word and then it's different meanings. From the late 15th century, echoic of bees and other insects, right? Bzzz. Uh, aviation sense of fly low and close in 1941. But check this out. A noun meaning a busy rumor. Attested from the 16th century. A busy rumor. How awesome to think of buzz as a busy rumor. So think about it that way. That's what I want you to think about. <laughs> now that we have had our sort of uh, English lesson, you know, I want to ask you a question. What company is really good at creating buzz right now? Think about a company that has everyone talking about it before they, you know, unveil something new. Can you think of one? Now, if you said Apple, then you're right. You know, they're so good at creating buzz about stuff. So yes, we're going to talk about Apple for a little bit. I know it's sort of cliche to use Apple as an example in marketing. I mean, you know, everybody does it. But I think in all previous 68 episodes, I, I haven't even used Apple as an example yet for anything. So I might as well do that now uh, when it's something that they do really, really well, which is the topic of today's show, creating buzz. Now, you might be thinking this. You might be thinking, Pat, it's so easy for Apple to create buzz because they have so many customers already. They have raving fans. They have people who are expecting something new on a very predictable schedule. Now, my response to you is, yeah. Yes, 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 you are absolutely right. And I want you to pay attention to what I just said before all those yeses. So let's break it down. First part, it's so easy because they have so many customers already. They have an existing audience, you know, a customer base. There's no easier way to start building buzz for something than if you already have an existing audience on your blog, you know, that's followers, subscribers, people on your email list, people who already read your stuff people on social media, and especially previous customers. If you're going to build buzz, start with people who know about you already and contact them directly if, you're can, if you can about what's to come. You know, those are the people who are, you know, are already going to be excited about what you have to offer, even without knowing exactly what it is yet. And you just drop in teasers here and there. And I mean, especially if they don't know what it is, they're going to be really excited. If you've already provided some awesome experience for them in the past in the form of a product or course or whatever, coaching experience, blog articles, blog articles, blog articles uh, podcasts, whatever, then they're going to want more just because they had a good, good experience with you already. And when you let them know something new is coming out, you know, they're, they're primed. They're primed. Okay, so the next part of what I had previously said, raving fans. You know, Apple just doesn't have a customer base. So they built a culture of raving fans, people who, who when they hear something new is coming out, you know, the new iPhone or new this or that or whatever, they're going to talk about it and they're not going to stop. They're going to blog about it, tweet about it, Facebook about it, just talk about it over lunch and dinner. They're going to they're gonna bother people with how much they're excited about this. They're going to dream about whatever it is. Um, so if you can get raving fans, then, then your money you know, and, and we could talk a whole episode about obtaining raving fans and how to get that. But we'll save that one for later because that's a really interesting and important topic that I want to leave on its own podcast. Now, don't worry if you, if, you know, you don't need all of this. You don't need a customer base, although it helps. You don't need raving fans. Of course, it helps. If you're just getting started and you don't have an existing customer base or don't have raving fans yet, don't worry. You know, I'm just sharing why it's so easy for Apple right now. And that uh, this is, of course, something you can shoot for. So we'll talk about stuff for those of you who have uh, really are just starting from scratch in just a second. But I want to continue. So we talked about, you know, they already have customers. They have raving fans. Next, people who are expecting something new. Expectation is the backbone behind building buzz. It's when people expect something new, something that may potentially change the game or, or improve their lives. That's when buzz happens. So the trick is creating that expectation. And for Apple specifically, you know, people expect Apple to create new things, you know, new, new version of whatever. And uh, just in general, and e each time there's massive amounts of buzz. If you can create something in your business that people can expect, something, maybe a line of products and new ones come out here and there or, or a series of something. For instance, um, you know, I do the income report and that builds buzz every month because people expect it and it's something new. You know, they, they know what's coming, but they don't know exactly what it's going to be like yet. That's what I do. And, and right now uh, I'm in the middle of this thing called the niche site duel uh, part two. And I'll get into that later in this session. Maybe I'm just throwing this out there. Maybe you're an Amazon fiction writer. 
and you were creating a sense of uh, a series of books, you know, sort of like episodes of a show or parts of a movie, then, you know, that's creating something people can look forward to, especially if you leave everyone hanging at the end of one of the previous books, you know, sort of like, you know, Back to the Future, you know, and in, in part one, Doc Brown came back, loaded up Mr. Fusion with beer and banana peels, and then he and Marty and Jennifer flew off to whoever, nobody knows, but you know, it said to be continued, that built a whole bunch of buzz for part two. In part two of Back to the Future, Doc got zapped back into who knows where until a car pulls up right then and there, hands Marty a letter from the past none other, uh, from none other than Doc Brown, who is in the Wild Wild West. I mean, crazy, right? Now you want to go see what the heck's going on there. And so that builds buzz for movie number three. I mean, gosh, you all know I'm a Back to the Future freak, right? Anyway, when you get people to expect something new, something that's coming out later, they're going to generate buzz about it. But again, Apple's been doing this for a while, so they have that working to their advantage because it's just sort of part of what they do already. And the last part of what I said earlier is that it's on a very predictable schedule. So when people know what date something is going to happen, not only will people anticipate that specific date and get excited about it, but you have a specific schedule you can follow leading up to that launch date. You know, you can better drop hints and generate excitement leading up to that date. Uh, Apple almost predictably comes out with new stuff each year, you know, during their during their Apple keynote um, presentations. Uh, th- there's there's a website dedicated to telling you whether or not it's actually a good time to buy specific Apple products based on when they they can predict the next models coming out. Now, that website is uh, if you go to buyersguide.macrumors.com. And it's, it's crazy, right? There's an entire website dedicated to Mac rumors. I mean, if you don't think buzz is important, um, you know, busy rumors, just see what kind of excitement this stuff gives people. I mean, entire blogs dedicated to buzz. I mean, that's awesome. Of course, that's Apple, and we're not Apple. So what can we do to create buzz? How do, how do we create buzz if we don't have a huge customer base? Or maybe, maybe you're selling something or coming out with something brand new, so you don't have that customer base. Maybe you've just recently started, but, you know, you know you have something worth buzzing about, but nobody else knows about it yet. The truth is, this is, this is the truth. If you have something awesome, if you have something that you know is helpful for people, that is worth talking about, then if you just build it, you're going to lose. <laughs> you probably thought I was going to say something else, but if you just build it, you're going to lose. You can't just build it. You have to market to. If you just build it, they're not going to come unless you get it in front of people in front of the right people too. But you don't have any people, you say, or you have a small group of people. Well, if you have a small group of people or followers already, or maybe a small existing customer base, they are everything to you. They should be everything to you. Love them. Get them excited. I mean, have you ever heard of this thing called your first thousand true fans? I mean, maybe maybe you haven't, but you know what you want to do is understand and try to get your first 1,000 true fans. And if, you, if you're not there yet, get your first 100 or even 10. These are people you know the names of. You know, find your true fans and get them to become ambassadors. You know, get them involved. You don't need very many people to make things happen. But whether you have people of your own or not, you're going to need to find more. And the way to do that is to put yourself onto platforms where people already exist where people are already looking for something you have to offer. You actually have to market and do the work in order to build buzz. Now, most people build and hope and then nothing happens. That's why they fail. Now, let me play an audio clip for you. That was from a previous episode about a guy who was a nobody before who didn't just sit back and build something and just wait. He went out there and made things happen. Now, you may recognize his voice. Let me play it for you. The approach I took is very similar to what's echoed in uh, an article called 1,000 True Fans by Kevin Kelly, who is the founding editor of Wired Magazine. Uh, I chose the least crowded channel, i.e. in-person meeting, as opposed to phone or email, to connect with people who are thought leaders in specific audiences, specific blogs, etc., by going to events like South by Southwest uh, Interactive, Blog World Expo, and so on. And I never hard sold the I never hard sold the book. Uh, what I mean by that is <clears throat> just shouting louder or or trying to do a better job of selling in a very mechanized way is not the best way to to find a fit for your content. If we're talking about content, 
my general approach was because I knew no one is I would I would sit in on a session, listen to panelists on topics that interested me, then approach the moderator of the panel and and give them ten seconds on who I was and ask them who they thought I might get along with, who was attending the event, whether it was a speaker or an attendee. And then I would I would meet person after person approaching things very similarly and ask each person, is there anyone else you think I should meet while I'm here? And I asked a lot of questions. Uh, what I mean by that is from the very outset, I wanted to understand what people were doing, uh, what they were planning on doing, what they did outside of work. And then if they asked me, well, what are you up to? I would say, oh, I'm working on my first book. It's pretty nerve wracking. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm here to try to figure out digital because my publisher has their hand in everything else. And this is really the only thing that I can do myself. And I don't know the first thing. And I would pretty much stop there and then go back to asking them questions. And if they dug deeper, what is your book about? Or, oh, really? And, and, and they, they asked about certain aspects, I would answer it. And at the very end, if someone genuinely seemed interested, and if not, I never pushed it. If someone genuinely seemed interested, I would say, look, I have a bunch of advanced copies that I, I, that I, I don't have places to send. If you'd like, I could just, I don't necessarily think you'd like the entire book, but I could use post-it notes to pick the 20 pages I think you would really like and send it off to you if you'd like that. And if they said, yes, great. If they said, no, I've got too much going on, that was fine too. And what that ensured was a few things. Number one, not only did I identify, in many cases, single author blogs with audiences of 100,000 or more, in many cases, where the content was a perfect fit because they'd gone through these filters of just uh, questioning back and forth. Uh, secondly, I ensured that I was developing friendships and relationships with people I liked as people anyway and who liked me as a person anyway, so that when I had the next launch, the four-hour body, when I had the launch after that, the four-hour chef, these are the same people I am still friends with starting in 2007. So it was relationship building as opposed to transactional. Of course, that was Mr. Tim Ferriss, author of The 4-Hour Workweek, talking about how he marketed that book and went from nowhere to almost everywhere uh, utilizing the power of building relationships. And then that book was rejected you know, by 27, I think, pub publishers before it was finally published. And that's how much he believed in his product, which obviously is really important. Um, he didn't have a platform of his own yet. So what did he do? He went out there, met people face-to-face. -face. He didn't pitch them. He just became, became friends with them. And then he got them interested in what he was doing. And then what happened? His book came out. Everyone started talking about it. And he was essentially everywhere. I mean, he put in the hard work. The buzz was being built for him. And uh, you know, his book shot to number one in the New York, as a New York Times bestseller. So that's the first strategy. I mean, we're going to go over a number of various strategies for building buzz. Some may be better for you than others. But what Mr. Tim Ferriss did, I would say, is, is probably the best thing you can do. You know, it's not always the easiest, but meeting people in person at conferences, at meetups, becoming friends, getting them interested in what you're up to, of course, um, is, is letting them know about what, what you're doing and, and asking them for help giving them free copies of whatever it is you have to offer so they can make the decision on their own whether to share it and invest themselves in it too or blog about it or whatever. That, that's the best thing you can do. And I really am happy that I was able to play that there for you uh, from Tim again because it's so important. Now, if you can't meet in person, you know, you, not, not everyone can. You know, the next, best, the next best thing is to make friends online with people who will hopefully share the same audience as your target audience. And yes, in person it's best, but you can probably relate to this next statement. I mean, you can become a really good friends with people online before you even meet them in person. I mean, it takes time, of course, but I know from experience, you know, I have a ton of friends online only who I felt a real connection with before I ever finally met them at a conference. And uh, yeah, I've met most of them already, um, but but even still, you know, we 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 all talk to each other even before we met. Uh, we link to each other, we retweet each other, and even talk on Skype and help each other out when we need to, or feel like uh, we have something worth promoting for each other. It's great. I mean, if if you have a group of close friends and you, and you're coming out with something, you know, th then let them know about it way ahead of time. You know, talk to them like you would normally talk to them, and talk to them about how excited you are. Even get them involved. You know, that's something I love to do, especially in my mastermind groups. I'm like, hey guys, I'm I'm so excited about this thing I have coming up. I'm still working through it. I'm struggling a little bit, uh, but this is how I want it to work. What do you guys think? Is this useful to you? How might you be able to to help me out? Uh, what what do you think should be included? 
And of course, if they're interested and they have something to add, uh, they'll be interested in keeping up with my progress. And if they're a good friend and it fits their audience, they're going to want to promote it. I mean, there's, there's not even any work involved uh, after that. You know, it's just time and, and relationship building. So that's strategy number one and two. You know, number one, meet and greet and share what's neat. Number two, uh, you know, build relationships and friends with uh, people online. Now, those are both two, of course, more sort of long-term strategies, but they're, they're so important. Uh, you know, and pick up the phone too. I mean, seriously, people, get on the phone, call people to talk, and see if there are any synergies between you and others. I mean, other people uh, and even other companies. You know, you may, you may connect with someone at another company who may jive with what you have going on. And it seriously just takes one to really help you out. And once you land that big din- that big name, for example, you know, to, to work with you on something, that's, that's, almost, that, that's almost instant credibility right there, which will get you in with other people too. Okay, so other strategies that I've seen being used. Strategy number three, the wait list. You know, anything with a, with a wait list must be pretty good, right? Well, not always, but if there's a wait list, this is what happens. If you're on it, you're anticipating when you're on it, you know, when you might not be on the wait list anymore, you might be in. You know, you're almost in, but not quite. And that, that's really powerful. And then when you're in, you share how awesome it is to be in and you get others who want to be on the wait list too, uh, you know, to come and, and be like, oh, I want that. So people who don't even know about whatever it is in the first place might come just because uh, there are people in the wait list or who are in already sharing their experience with that product. Now, case in point, there's this iPhone app that just recently came out called Mailbox. And it's a mail client for iOS that can be used instead of the, uh, you know, the built-in mail app from Apple. And the way they released it was it was, it was a slow rollout you know, using a wait list, which is actually pretty common in the, in the startup world. So what they did was they released the app to the first, you know, X number of people who downloaded it. I'm not sure the exact number. But then everyone else who downloaded it after got put on the wait list. One that you could actually see where you were in line. I mean, uh, and, and how many spots were both ahead of you and also the number of people who signed up and got the app after you. So people who were in line behind you. Now, I remember seeing a picture of someone's placement on the wait list for this app uh, on Instagram. And it was like 150,000 in line, they, they said. So of course I immediately downloaded the app because I didn't, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to wait any longer. Uh, you know, the app's free. So I could hold my place in line too. And, and I was seeing, I think I was at like 350,000 in line. And of course they conveniently put a share button on there for anyone to announce where they were uh, in line with a link to download the app, which is really smart. You know, there was lots of press about this app. And as a result of the buzz that was created, um, they they just exploded, you know. When and it just it just it was pretty awesome how how they managed to use the waitlist to their advantage because they could have easily just released it to everybody, um, the the moment they downloaded it, but they didn't. They used the power of the waitlist to generate buzz. Okay, strategy number four: scarcity. You know, similar to the waitlist, if people know there's only a limited number of spots available for something like a course, or maybe you're going to sell X number of copies of something, then that creates buzz too, while at the same time playing on people's need to not want to lose out on an opportunity. You know, people hate to lose opportunities, uh, which which the scarcity thing is is great for. It could be, like I said, for a number, a limited number of spots in something or a number of copies, or it could be also a limited amount of time. And this is why sales work so well. I mean, right now it's Memorial Day uh, and I'm seeing all these commercials on TV and hearing them on the radio for sales for all kinds of things that end today. You know, cars or, you know, whatever sales going on at the mall. Just just this weekend, you know, only till end of day Monday or something. Um, you know, that makes people come into the stores now and start talking about that with their friends because they want to be the ones to tell their friends that they have these opportunities. It makes them look better and feel empowered. Um, and thus, buzz ensues. I mean, you may have seen promotions done online that utilize a timer. You know, that's scarcity in the sense that time will run out for that deal. Now, if you're going to use a strategy and have a timer or say something's only limited for a certain amount of time or a certain number of spots, you need to make sure you stick to the schedule and truly limit the spots or stop selling after time runs out. You know, if you don't, then you're just falsely using scarcity and people can see right through that. And that's just, that's just bad. I mean, sometimes you can, you know, you go to these pages with a timer and you just refresh it. And uh, it just resets. I mean, that's that's not cool. You might as well, you might as well be an infomercial playing at three thirty in the morning, right? Okay, so that's scarcity. Using scarcity to build buzz. This is great, especially if you're coming out with one of your first products, and you only, you know, you want to make sure you fill all the spots. 
and you want to limit it to a number of spots so that you can have sort of a number of data users in there to help you refine the product before you open it up for even more people. Okay, so strategy number five, make an event out of it. So if you're going to launch something or come out with something new, you want to treat the day it comes out like it's a huge deal, like like it's a really big event. If you can think of it that way, lots of things will fall into place. This is more of a mindset sort of strategy than it is an actionable strategy because it involves lots of actions coming together. You know, think of a, a wedding. That, that, that's a huge deal or, or graduation. You know, it's something people know that's coming. So there's a specific date to look forward to. It's something to celebrate, something to plan ahead for. I mean, for a wedding, there's the, you know, the save the date card, which comes like three months in advance or whatever, the wedding invitations, the engagement party, the bachelor and bachelorette parties, all this stuff leading up to the big day, all creating buzz for it. You know, same thing for graduation and baby showers and babies and yeah, all that stuff. You know, there's lots of planning involved and lots of people involved too. So think of your launch like that. And also, case in point, you just, just know that it can't be done alone. You know, the more help you can get along the way, the more successful your launch, your promotion or whatever it is, is going to be. And it has to be planned ahead. This is exactly what I did for the recent niche site duel that was just launched. Instead of us, you know, instead of save the date cards and RSRPs and engagement and parties and stuff like that, you know, I published strategically research posts for niche site duel related stuff. And I hinted at the new niche site duel coming out. Then I mentioned the date of when it was going to launch and I got people involved to let me know that they were in. And and in one single post, I had over a thousand comments within 24 hours from people who were essentially, quote, RSVPing to join me. And you know what? So many people last Wednesday, when I said that the the niche site duel was going to launch, they were like emailing me and sending me tweets. Where's your post? Where's your post? I keep I keep hitting refresh F5 on my keyboards wearing out. You know, it was just so awesome to see that there was so much buzz for this this thing that I was promoting or coming out with. And it wasn't even a product. It was just a series of posts that's that's coming out or an experiment or case study that's happening. So you see, I sort of drip fed little pieces leading up to the big event here and there. First through a number of research posts and podcast sessions I did talking about things like keyword research and search engine optimization. I used big names like Neil Patel and other ones uh, that people knew, Spencer Hawes, uh, which added to the flair, of course. You know, do the same thing. Do the same thing. If you're going to launch something before the day of your big event or launch, you know, share interviews or, or pieces of what you're going to be launching for free you know, with your audience and make it, make it worth incredible value and just give it away for free. You know, it's only going to help you spread the word and generate word of mouth buzz so that when you do launch, things will happen on their own because people are already expecting it and waiting for it. Again, just make a huge event out of it. Okay, strategy number six, create a series. So leading up to the event can be pretty confusing for some. You know, how do you do it? How do you lead up to your event that you're creating? Uh, One way I like to think about it is by creating a series. You know, this is very common. It sort of goes along the themes of the whole product launch formula thing that you may have heard of before. What it is is a series of typically videos or something of high value that comes out sequentially over time that build onto each other. And then finally, the event happens at the end of like the culmination of it all. And the purpose of the series is to, again, build buzz and anticipation for the event that's to come. You know, I just mentioned the Niche Site Duel 2.0 thing that I'm doing right now. It was about the span of two weeks that I sort of prepared for this and included a rather, I started by including a rather controversial video interview with Alex Becker about SEO to start. And and that, that wasn't by accident. You know, that was on purpose. I knew it was going to start to get people talking and interested in what was going on. Then it was a couple of podcast sessions, a post here and there, and then another interview all within two or three days apart from each other. They each added a different flavor to the mix. Nothing was repeated. They all added value and also within each of those posts or podcasts, I got more and more revealing about what exactly was going to happen when the exact launch date for Niche Site Duel 2.0 was. And the final piece of the series, which was the beginning of the case study, just came out last week and, and was completely in high demand. So it was awesome. I literally, I literally felt a ton of pressure uh, to get that post published by the end of the day, my launch post for NSD 2.0, uh, which is why some of you on Twitter probably saw that uh, I mentioned 
that the last couple of paragraphs were giving me so much trouble because they were just the most important ones. And I knew every, everybody was waiting for me. So I felt a lot of pressure there, which is kind of interesting. Okay, strategy number seven. This is something I've seen a lot of top marketers do online. Uh, and I haven't yet had the experience of doing this myself. Um, but a lot of people do this, especially at the end of their sort of series on their event day. You know, what they do is they host webinars. They'll host webinars before or for a launch instead of just saying, oh, hey, here's my thing. Uh, come get it. You know, they say, hey, come on this webinar with me. I'll teach you or show you how to do this and that, you know, and then I'll be pitching something at the end, you know, providing a ton of free value. People could go to the webinar and get exactly what they need and leave. But what happens is you give away so much free stuff and you, you, people get to know who you are. When you pitch at the end, you know, and again, if you, pitch, if, you just, if you just give away so much value that, you know, that not much pitching is needed, but you still have to pitch. Um, and, and yeah, so they create an, an event out of the launch of their product. And it's, it, it's not just a specific type of event, not just a launch day, but a webinar where people can come on, they can ask questions, interact and participate, be involved in the discussion. All that is so important. A lot of you may have seen uh, my buddy Derek Halpern from socialtriggers.com. He's doing a lot of webinars lately, a lot of webinars lately. You may have seen some of his ads on Facebook for various things he has going on. And you know what? He's doing really, really well with them. And I get his emails too leading up to his promotion. So make sure you follow him, sign up to his email, email list, and just see what he does. You know, obviously he has a very particular style. It's pretty much the complete opposite of me. Uh, But, you know, we're really good friends for some reason. And uh, check out the timing of everything he does. You know, I really look up to him and the way he does his marketing. Um, Although I'm much more reserved in in how I speak. (laughs) Um, Strategy number eight. Run a sweepstakes or a contest. So sweepstakes or contests are great for creating viral campaigns and spreading awareness of your brand and creating buzz for something particular you might be coming out with. Now, please note that there are typically a lot of rules and legal things that go along with sweepstakes in contests, which are different, actually. Sweepstakes uh, award winners at random. Contests award winners based on skill or popularity or judging of some kind. So just something to think about. But yeah, there are often a lot of rules and legal things that go along with with both contests and sweepstakes. So just keep that in mind if you're going to run a giveaway. You know, make sure you do it the right way. I ran one for Nissite Duel. Uh, I know I keep using using that as as an example, but I definitely and purposefully used most of these tools in my toolbox for the launch of it. Uh, in, in one of the posts, I asked people to leave a comment in order to be entered into a random drawing for Longtail Pro, which is a software uh, keyword research an SEO analysis tool that I'll be using dur- during this case study. I was going to give away five copies. Uh, and, and that's the post that led to about 1,200 comments within the first 24 hours, um, which does wonders for social proof, of course. And I probably could have taken that a step further and asked people to like the post in order to qualify or, or maybe uh, get another entry or tweet using the hashtag of some sort to get an extra entry or something like that. I didn't do that. Um, but it was still successful, and, and, and when I launched the, the niche site duel, about 2,000 people immediately signed up to participate so far, uh, and counting, uh, more and more coming each day, which is, which is really cool. In the future, I'm definitely going to make use of social media a lot better when it comes to contests and sweepstakes, um, so just keep that in mind. I know Jeremy from shoemoney.com, he, uh, he used to use Twitter really, really well for creating viral campaigns. I can't remember exactly where or what i think he created some sort of post talking about how he did that i'll try to find it and if i do i'll put it on the show notes smartpassiveincome.com slash session 69 um it shares how he utilized twitter for some of his viral campaigns i don't know if it's still around it was about four or five years ago i, I read into that um he was one of the first to really do some interesting things on twitter and lastly uh let's talk about strategy number nine which is get testimonials you know, I sort of mentioned this before, but not really. Before you launch, give it away, whatever it is you have. Give it away to a few key people and get them to say something great about it, you know, if you can. If you can, get it done on video too. It's just, it's just much more real and personable that way. You know, and the, the, the bigger name the person has, as in the more popular they are, the more they're going to connect with your target audience and the more of an impact that video or testimonial will make and the more buzz it's going to make. So this is something you can share before you launch with everybody or even after you launch or as you launch, you know, just or you can just keep it on your sales page. But, you know, the more great testimonials you can get, the better. 
having someone else talk about how good your product is is much, much more powerful than anything you could ever say on your own. So think about any sort of video game or, or, or how about a movie that's not quite out yet. You know, you start to, to get hit with a series of trailers. You know, you, it's a series. You get to see them, uh, these trailers on TV. You hear them on the radio. You, you check them out on the, on the app, uh, the trailer app on your phone. Maybe you go to the movies. You see a theatrical trailer there. They're just injecting their brand or their movie into your lives like here and there until you start to take notice. And you'll notice that on those trailers or in magazines when you see promos for these movies, um, you know, they'll, you'll see quotes from famous magazines. You know, they're testimonials. You know, Rolling Stone says, it can't get any better than this. Uh, People Magazine says, breathtaking. I mean, that's my favorite one. Seriously, you can look at any sort of thing that comes out on a certain date, something with millions of dollars in advertising behind it, and just see what they do. And the beauty of it is that we can do a lot of the same things as them just in the online world. And in the online world, and especially in the niche that you're serving, it's definitely going to cost much less. And it may not even cost you anything at all. Movies that come out, books, presidential debates, uh, new electronic devices or video game systems, new pieces of software, the new Air Jordans or the new Nike Air Mags, you know, Google Goggles or Glass or whatever it's called, uh, you know, pay attention. Actually, pay attention to Google Glass right now. Uh, we're right in the middle of the pre-launch sequence. You'll start. You, you've probably noticed a few videos here and there, a number of different blogs and uh, talking about it. Um, it's worth paying attention to just to see how they roll this out. You know, notice when the videos come out, when you hear about it on other blogs, and what people are saying about it. Notice when the actual date finally gets released and what happens then, and try to get a feel for the buzz when it happens. It's a very, very powerful thing. So I hope those strategies make sense to you. Just to go over them one more time, strategy number one, meet and greet and share what's neat. Uh, that's uh, you know actually meeting people in person and getting them interested in what you have. Uh, strategy number two, building relationships and real friendships online. Those two are almost a given. Number three, utilizing a wait list of some kind, especially if your product calls for one. Uh, strategy number four, scarcity. Stra- strategy number five, make an event out of it. Strategy number six, create a series leading up to that event. Strategy number seven, maybe combine that event with a webinar and get people to interact. Strategy number eight, run a contest or sweepstakes. And lastly, strategy number nine, get testimonials. I wish I could go into each and every one of these on their own and each each and every one of these could probably make its own podcast episode actually actually we have a couple on webinars already so go back in time listen to the one with lewis house um i can't remember the exact number right now but i'll put that in the show notes it's a great one on on webinars um and yeah dude, just like i really hope this session resonated with you because buzz is so powerful and these are strategies that you can take with you to infinity and beyond Um, And if you get what I just did there, let me know on Twitter, at Pat Flynn. But before we go, we have a question from a listener uh, that I'm going to play. This is from Alex from ModernHealthMonk.com, who has some questions about autoresponders and using multiple lists and staying organized. So let's play the audio. Hey, Pat. This is Alex from uh, ModernHealthMonk.com. And I just have a quick question on autoresponders. Um, I'm in the health niche, and... I have a number of autoresponders, like for for weight loss or different health problems, um, and I also have a main list autoresponder. I'm just wondering how to how to kind of use autoresponders effectively without spamming my audience and um, and still you know pre program pre programming those so that they're delivering value just months and months ahead of time, and you know it, it's hands off for me. Um, but again, without without spamming people because I have multiple lists and. Trying to, some people, you know, they double opt in on multiple lists. So sometimes they're getting, you know, a weight loss message and then they're getting a normal list message. And then, you know, if I notify them of a new, really new epic post that I think they should read, then they may be, maybe you're getting three a week. And that's for me, you know, if I were getting three a week from one, one list, I'd unsubscribe. So just wondering, you know, if you notify people of new posts or how you use or how you would use multiple autoresponders. Uh, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Hey, Alex, thanks for your question. Um, You know, I really love that you said adding value to your readers and subscribers because that's exactly what you want to do, always. And so you've got the first step already. This just shows me that whatever you send to your subscribers, whether it's through an autoresponder or through your broadcast, um, it's going to be useful. And that is, of course, the main thing. So you've already shown that you've got your head on straight when it comes to email lists. Uh, When it comes to using multiple 
lists, which I, that's a really smart thing to do. You know, uh, separating parts of your audience within your lists, so you can hit them specifically with stuff that's tailored just for them. But one thing to keep in mind is that generally, uh, at least this is the way it is for um, for most email software, and this is the case for Aweber, which is what I use. I don't, I'm not sure what you use, Alex, um, but a lot of a lot of them do this. If you have a single person across multiple lists, maybe one person signed up to your main list, and then also someone to your weight loss list, and then someone to your cardio list, or whatever you have. Uh, if you send one broadcast out to all of your lists. You know, I know a lot of people worry that they're going to get that email three times if they're on three different lists. But I know Aweber has this thing called automatic deduplicating, which is awesome. And that makes sure that if you send a broadcast to all of your lists together, each person should only get that email one time, even if they're on every single list. So uh, just make sure your email service provider does that. If you're, if you're on Aweber, that's, you, know, you don't have to worry. Now, one thing I like to do to keep things organized a little is to keep Monday and Tuesday open only for broadcast emails to everyone. And these could be any days of the week that you want, but I have specifically Monday and Tuesday only for broadcast emails, and then the rest of the week only for autoresponders. So this really helps me make sure that, okay, today's Monday, nobody's getting any other emails from me today, so if I send a broadcast out, it's the only one they're going to get. Personally, I think, and it depends on every uh, audience that's out there, of course, but uh, personally, I think if you send two emails per week on opposite sides of the week, um, that's going to be okay, especially if, like you said, Alex, you're going to always be providing value. Now, you might even do it uh, so that every Wednesday is weight loss and Thursday is another list and Friday is, is a, another one. You know, Again, just to make sure that you're not hitting people twice in a single day. But I think if, if you set the ex- expectations up front, you know, when people sign up for a new list, okay, you're going to get another email uh, set of emails here if you sign up here, um, and you just happen to place them on different days than the other ones, then then you should be totally good. Then you should be to, uh, totally good. So hopefully that helps. I have a couple of other email resources and autoresponder things I'll put into the show notes. Again, that's smartpassiveincome.com slash session 69. And thanks again, Alex, for your question. If you have a question, if you're a listener out there and you have a question you'd like to send me and possibly get on the show, go to speakpipe.com slash Pat Flynn, P-A-T-F-L-Y-N-N. And I look forward to hearing from you. So thank you all so much for your attention today. Again, show notes and links and resources available at smartpassiveincome.com slash session 69. And look out for more niche site dual posts coming up uh, at this point. You know, at this point in the recording, I'm pretty sure I found my target keyword. I've done keyword research for a few days now. I'm struggling at the beginning, wasn't finding anything, but I think I found the one I'm going to use. It's a little, it's a little competitive. We'll see. I might, I might stumble upon one that that's a little more open, but we'll see. Uh, and I'm still going to conduct research just in case. But you know, I can't wait to share it with you. So look out for that soon. Please, if you have a second, just a second, please leave the SPI podcast an honest rating in iTunes if you haven't already. It really helps with the rankings and the popularity of the show. Um, we're currently up to 839 five-star ratings, which is awesome, and I would love yours there too, even if it's a one-star rating. If it's honest, it's all I care about. I want to improve if you feel like I need to, um, and I know I do. Now, if you're looking for speakers for your event, this is a new announcement I've never done before. If you're looking for speakers for your event, uh, maybe in, two, uh, in 2014, you know, hit me up on the contact form at patflynn.me, and I look forward to seeing or speaking to all of you in session number 70. All right, have a good one. All the best to you. Cheers and bye. Thanks for listening to the Smart Passive Income Podcast at www.smartpassiveincome.com. Hey there, and thanks for sticking around to the end. If you're looking for more great shows like this one, definitely give How Success Happens a listen, another great show from the Entrepreneur Podcast Network. On How Success Happens, Robert Tuckman features some of today's brightest entrepreneurial minds talking about overcoming challenges and viewing them as learning experiences to create success. The challenges that entrepreneurs face are ultimately what make many of us successful, however we define success, and that's what the show is all about. 
There's lots of names you'll surely recognize on the show every single week. Just recently, Robert had Nasty Gal CEO Sophia Amoruso on the show and the former CEO of Snapple the week before that, which is really awesome. So listen to How Success Happens right now on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or Stitcher.